How many of you believe there's no grave that can hold our body down? In Jesus' name, he walked out of that grave and we can walk out too, amen? Come on, we're going to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords tonight. He is worthy of all of our praise. God, we bless your holy name tonight, Jehovah. You are worthy of all the praise and the honor tonight. No fear is ever going to shake this ground. Lord, we thank you for the power of the cross that gives us a victory ahead of us, God, that we don't have to go back where we came from, 
but we're going forward with you, God. Every day is a new day. Every day, God, we're blessed. Every day we have the victory because of the finished work that you did on the cross of Calvary, Lord. So we're thankful tonight, Lord, that your cross, the finished work, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Savior, God gives us the victory. And, Lord, this is our victory, Lord. We proclaim it tonight that your finished work has finished the work in us and begun a good work each and every day as we follow you. And we believe you, God, that the cross has the final word in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Sorrow may come in the darkest night, but the cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Evil may put up its strongest fight, but the cross has the final word. The cross has the final word.
the cross has the power. Give him a shout of praise. If you know that tonight, that the victory's in him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, you're great, Lord. Restore. 
Praise the name of the Lord. Come on, how many of you know he is worthy? How many of you know he's great? His name is great. Amen. How many of you know his name is above every name? Amen. So I, I, I want to, I want you to hear about a miracle. And then I'm going to introduce you to the miracle. Um, obviously, we believe in miracles. And I, I don't believe they're a one-off deal. We know it's the will of God. And, you know, when you go for it, that's what happens. So, uh, yesterday, I found out that Brother Tony Alexander and Tanner Tabor and Zach Tinsley were going to Evansville to pray for a young man. And he, the young man had requested that Pastor Tony get some men and come pray for him. Book of James. Let, let them call for the elders of the church. It doesn't mean the church you sit in it means the church let the elders call or let the sick call for the elders of the church anointing them with oil pray the prayer of faith and they'll be healed it's a pretty simple recipe so brother Tony called and Tanner and Zach went with him and they go lay hands on this young man now Rochelle I'm going to need your help with the medical end okay because you're one of the medical people and you know all those things so um, his his kidney function was what? He was in kidney failure. Okay, so that like means you have a microphone. I'm like you have one of these. <laughs> For people who have kidney problems and you know about a creatinine, because people have dealt with that, a normal creatinine is like. 0.6 to 1.3 and his got up to over 7 so in most cases those people are, are already on dialysis and you're you're trying to figure out you know are we going to have to do a kidney transplant or what's going on here So, wow and hadn't eaten in a week Nathan could you come here sir Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you a miracle. <laughs> miracle. Isn't that wonderful? Come on, give Jesus some praise. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. Amen. I, I love they were telling me yesterday in our staff meeting that this this young man called and said hey, you'd seen brother Tony's testimony is that correct yes and you said if the Lord healed him the Lord will heal me yes sir now look at that <laughs> oh my god And then you requested that Brother Tony come and bring some men with him, correct? Yes, sir. And you, I love it, man. I love it because all I hear is faith in God. That's all I hear. It's wonderful. Okay, so, so they all laid hands on you, anointed you with oil. That's scripture. You requested it. Just, I mean, the whole thing is like line on line. And when they were praying for you, what, what happened? I, I, just, I just started shaking. I could feel it leave my body from my head to my toes. And all I can say is I'm healed. I know I'm healed. I guess so. I mean, here you are. Now. My gosh. Okay, so 
you requested a meal. T tell them, tell the people what you asked for. KFC. The gospel bird, hallelujah. I mean, man, guess he already got to eat chicken. So you hadn't eaten in a week, and then you ate, like, I think it was like a chicken nugget, drank a 44-ounce drink, and something else, and... Ding-dong, <laughs> and uh, six ounces of pineapple. Wow, and held it all down. Yeah. And you feel great. Yes, sir. Well, you look great. Praise the Lord. So again, everyone, look. Here he is. A miracle in the flesh. Praise the Lord. Awesome, brother. Love you. Man, that's great. Go hug that guy. My God. Isn't that wonderful? I mean, the Lord's so good. Hallelujah. Now, here, here's the thing. That, that's not a one-off deal. I mean, we see that kind of stuff happen. And I'm telling you this. You're going to see more of it. We're in an hour now where it's going to become so common for things like that. To, I mean, that's incredible. And you, I know you've been to, they said you were calling everybody and telling them that the Lord healed you. You should tell everyone you meet what happened to you. You should tell everyone. Amen. Because when you testify to that, that's letting those people know just like what, when you heard about Brother Tony. It's letting them know, hey, if God did it for him, God will do it for me. Amen? I'm telling you, if you're in this room and you're having trouble with your kidneys, like you're having kidney problems, you need to stretch your hands to heaven and receive from the Lord. Say, well, if God did it for him, then I, he'll do it for me. Amen? So we know it's already been paid for. He just, he understood that and received from God. So if you're having trouble with your kidney, stretch your hands to heaven right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. The name above kidney disease. The name above kidney failure. In the name of Jesus. Receive your healing now. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, declare it just like Nathan did. I'm healed. Amen. My Lord. <laughs> he will do it. See? Book of Acts Christians and the Book of Acts Church using Book of Acts principles get Book of Acts results. That's how it happens. Praise the Lord. Man, congratulations, brother, on life. You know, it's like people congratulate you when you get a job or a new car. It's like congratulations on life. I mean, tell everybody, everywhere you go, what God did for you. Man, what a testament. I mean, that's incredible. I, I, I want to get more information from everybody that was involved, like, Write some, you're good at writing stuff now, so do that, and so we can we can have all that to keep up with. And I, I want to share more of it because it's so awesome. I mean, it's so incredible. Amen. Amen. Welcome, Pastor Sue. What? Oh. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So you got a friend that's having kidney trouble. Yes. Tanner. Brother Tony, Zach. Yeah, that's right. So, so when something like this happens, you're you're now you're in the ministry. That's how that works. Okay, so raised up from a sick bed, and you lay hands on people, and they get healed. So, what's this kid's name? Chris Carr, and he's having kidney trouble or kidney failure? Okay, all right. Okay, lay hands on him, Brother Tony. He's standing in the gap for his friend. In the name of Jesus. 
pray, boys. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that Chris is healed. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We thank you that he's healed. We thank you that he's healed. We declare he's healed. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You're the Alpha and Omega. You're a miracle working God. Oh, yeah. You're a miracle working God. You're a miracle working God. You're the Alpha and Omega. You're a miracle working God. Come on, church. You're a miracle working God. is such a bum. What a defeated, weak, toothless, worthless bum. Hallelujah. And you've got authority over him. Glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. Pastor Sue. Come on, isn't it good to be in the house of God? Father, we worship you. We praise your holy name. You are a miracle working God. A miracle working God. If you're here tonight and you don't know the miracle working God is your Lord and your Savior, I want you to know Him. Not only will He do a work in your life physically, but He'll do a work in your life spiritually. He'll do it. When he was on his way to the cross, he stopped at the whipping post and he paid for your healing. But he refused to stop there. He kept going to the cross. And when he went to the cross, he went and paid for your salvation. Whole physically and whole spiritually. And you may be here tonight and you say, I don't know him as my Lord and my Savior. I need him as my Lord and my Savior. You've recognized tonight that he's a healer. But you need to know him as a Savior. You need to know that when you close your eyes in death that you're on your way to heaven. Because if you haven't received him as your Lord and your Savior, when you close your eyes in death, you'll split hell wide open. So we have the opportunity to spend eternity with our Savior. And then while we're here on this earth, we can live with Him here. Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. Because when you accept Him as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and lives on the inside of you. To comfort you. To lead you and to guide you along this walk so I'm going to ask if there's anyone here tonight or somewhere within the sound of my voice online 
that says, I do not know him as my Lord and my Savior. And I want to know him that way. I want to accept him into my life. And I want to make a choice to follow him. I want to make a choice to follow him now. If that's you, tonight is your night for a miracle. So on the count of three, if that's you, I just ask that you lift your hand. If you're online, on the count of three, I ask that you push that emoji button that lifts your hand so that we know and we can pray for you. One, he's a miracle working God. Two, this is the greatest miracle, your salvation. And three, if it's you, lift your hand to heaven right now. I want him as my Lord and my Savior. Anyone at all in this room or online. Anyone at all, I need him as my Lord and my Savior. Maybe you found yourself in a position of being away from God. But all of a sudden, something stirred on the inside of you. And you say, I got to come close. I got to get back to him. I got to get back to my first love. If that's you, just lift your hand. Anybody at all? We praise your holy name, Father. Father, we worship you tonight. I thank you, Lord. I thank you for being a miracle worker in our life. I give you praise because you're a healer and you're a savior. You're a deliverer. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Brother Tony. I told Brother Chris I wanted about a minute, and I won't take but a second. When Brenda called me Monday night, you know how God works things out. She said, bring some oil and some people with you. Tanner was the first one that came to my mind. And I said, Lord, I need some oil. And he said, you got some. I said, where have I got it? He said, remember about 30, 35 years ago, you bought a bottle and put in your old Bible? Oh, wow, I do. So I go scratching around, and I find my old Bible, and I found a little bottle of oil that had never been opened. The Lord said, I'm saving this for a special occasion. Amen. It's a little different when a miracle comes to your house. Amen. I love it. Father, we thank you. I just stand in awe of you. Just talking to a friend today. And I don't have any other word to say, but I'm just in awe of you. And what you do and who you are. May I never stop being amazed. May we never stop pressing in. May we never stop believing that your word, it's all true. It's all true. And so we walk in your word. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Come on, if you'll find your seats just for a moment. Look at somebody and tell them you love them. You're glad that they're here? I love looking across the room and seeing happy faces. Amen? Amen. We're going to slip into the next part of our service of tithe and offering. Come on. The Word of God says He loves a cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver. The Word of God I was reading and I was studying today about giving. And the Word of God also says that we're blessed to be a blessing. 
We're blessed to be a blessing. My goodness. Who is God going to use to bless the kingdom? Say, he's going to use me. He's going to use me. If I'm a tither and I'm a giver, he's blessed me to be a blessing. And so I want to bless others. Amen. It's incredible what life in Christ gets to do across this county, across this nation, across the globe. Whew. I just had a flash of the streets in Brazil. three years old running by herself and knowing at any moment she could be snatched up by the wrong person but because of your faithfulness because of your giving she gets to go to life impact every day she gets a good meal she gets taught the word <laughs> she gets taught who Jesus is and when she's never experienced love in her life she gets to experience it for the first time because of Life in Christ Church and so many other churches that are involved in Life Impact but that's just one of the places thank you, thank you thank you, amen we're going to change the world Father in the name of Jesus I thank you for every tither and every giver I believe in the name of Jesus that the windows of heaven are opened up over their life because just like we said earlier it's all true it's all true. So in the name of Jesus, pour out blessing. Blessed to be a blessing we are. And we give you praise for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. glad you chose has been part of your day here with us. We'd like to take a few minutes to tell you about some things coming up here at Life in Christ. The Senior Food Handup Program will be distributing food and paper goods this Thursday, January the 11th from 10 to 12 noon. We will begin preparing at 9 a.m. Please feel free to come join and help out with this ministry. Ladies, this Friday is our women's meeting. Prayer will start at 6.15 and service starts at 7. All ladies, sixth grade and up, are welcome to attend. This is a great way to start the new year being in the house of God with the women of God. We hope to see you here. Praise the Lord. Well, I'd say we're off to a pretty good start. Amen. Man, it's been a it's been an awesome start to the year. Amen. We uh what are we like seven days in now? To the fast. <laughs> Feels like ten. I know I know 
you know, everybody's doing something different on it. But if you're doing anything, you're doing something, right? And so if, it, if you're increasing your prayer time and your time in the Word, even if you're just skipping one meal, it's making a major difference. And that, that's really what I'm doing. Is I'm skipping a meal and, in, and putting an increase on all that. And I can already tell a major difference just in the sharpness. And, man, I mean, look at what it's doing already in, in this house. You come here for pre-service prayer, you can tell a major difference. It's, it's a major difference. People pray different when they're hungry. <laughs> Lord, Lord, help <laughs> Give me KFC. <laughs> oh man, praise the Lord. Uh, anyway, so w Sue and I got to go up and preach in Bowling Green the other night, and uh, that service went very well. It's, I don't know, eight or nine people came to the altar for salvation, and. Uh, or, re, or like rededication, one of the two, and then several people got touched that night by the power of God, and then we went Monday night to Nortonville and preached at the river. That went great. Uh, man, the glory of God really came in there that night, and uh, it was quite the experience, and so that was wonderful. And so this Sunday night, we'll be going back to Bowling Green and preaching there again, and so I'm looking forward to that, be praying for us. Uh, for that service, be praying. Be praying for this Sunday morning service here. This past Sunday was super powerful, and uh, honestly, I really feel like every service is going to be that way. And it will be up to you as an individual what you get out of that. You can come in here and say it, and just eh, okay, it's another service. Yay, we're at church, and then you'll go away still frustrated. Or you can come in and be engaged, be engaged in worship, come for pre-service prayer, be engaged. You know, sometimes you getting out of your seat, I'm just doing a little whatever, housework, pastor work, whatever you call it. You know, people want to touch from God, but they don't want to put in anything, any kind of effort. God, if you're going to touch me, just come do it. I'm like, maybe get out of your comfort zone a little, you know? I mean, if you get out from where you sit, at least to get in the aisle to worship during worship time, or walk down front and, like, engage. Yeah, but I've been through a lot. Okay, who hasn't? So, you know, I mean, you just saw a kid walk up here who should not be here. By physical, if you just go by physical law, he should not be here. But he, he exercised a law called faith, and now he's here. You know, I mean, we're not his home church, but thank God he came by to at least be with us and share what God did for him, you know. And I, I, I don't know. It's like people want God to do everything for them, and they want to put nothing in. But that, that's not scripture. Like that's not how it works. God, I want this. God, I want that. God, I want this. Do this for me. 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 And I'm just going to hang out here in my pew and wait. Sure is getting quiet in here. Turn to Hebrews 11.6. Might as well. Now, you just keep that up there, and I'm going to read verse 5, and then I'll come to that, okay? Verse 5 says, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found, because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. So obviously his faith was up there. You know, when you're walking with the Lord and then 
you know, bit of, hey, have you seen Enoch anywhere? Like I just ran into him yesterday, and I've been, you know, I've been trying to call him, and he won't answer. Have you been by his house? I went by, he wasn't home. Hmm. He might have left town for some reason. Wonder what's going on. Three or four days go by, he still ain't showed up. Missing, missing person report filed. No sign of him. Can't find him. Because he walked with the Lord and he was no more. So he was, I mean, <laughs> that is awesome. I mean, I read the Bible and I'm like, this book is so cool. Like this stuff happens. Like the Bible is not dead. God's not dead. The Bible is a living breathing word because Jesus you see in John uh, 1 that the word was with God the word was God and the word came and dwelt among us the word is alive the word is sharp it's sharper than any two-edged sword the Bible says cuts to the marrow it cuts to the heart of the matter I, I see Christians frustrated all the time and, and they say, I just, I want this, and I want a touch from God. I'm like, okay. So what are you doing? What are you doing to be on fire? What are you doing to get a touch from God? You know, if you have a pile of wood, and it's burning, and one log rolls off, if you don't put it back on there, it goes out. Should I just drop the mic now and we go home and everybody chew on that till we come back? People get out of the fire, then they can't figure out why they don't feel like they did. Get back on the fire. Offer yourself to God. Okay. You asked for it. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. Oh, yes, I believe in God. I believe God is all that. Okay, well, let's go a step further then. And that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Well, you know, I just don't expect anything from God. Well, you won't get anything then. But you could. You could. Well, I don't believe we're supposed to expect anything from God. Okay, can you put that back up? Because if you're not supposed to expect anything from God, then please explain this to me. No takers, okay. Because I'm telling you, if you listen to people, you, you start listening to people, and you start talking to them about God, His faithfulness, what you can believe for, what, can, what you can expect to get from God, and you start hearing doubt creeping out of their mouth. I'm telling you, people, I listen to the words that come out of people's mouth because I can start to take an inventory of where they stand with God. Well, you know, brother, we don't have to, I, I just don't expect much from God. I'm like, you're full of doubt. That's doubt talk. So you're judging them. No, I'm judging the fruit of their life. And I'm telling you, if that's coming out of their mouth, then they don't have a real revelation on who God is and what God wants for their life. You're a child of God. You don't have to beg God. Seek God. Seek God in His goodness. Seek, I mean, God has a will for you. And it's great. So I don't know if I even know the will of God. He gave us a book full of it. Y'all okay? Y'all were happy a minute ago. And now that you find out, you're going to have to put some effort in. It's like, hey, well, hang on a minute, preacher. I'm going to have to do something. Well, if you want anything, like, that sounds like works to me. Well, it's not works in the thought that you're thinking. However, when you get born again, there is some work you're going to have to put in. How many of you know Paul said labor with me? There, there's labor, like prayer. When we're here for pre-service prayer, and like tomorrow night, we'll be over in the, in the youth room praying. There's labor. There's a labor to that. It's work. Oh, help me, Jesus. I found out in church life 
that church life is much like the work life. Twenty people work at the company, fifteen really put out, five just hang out and enjoy. Oh. They enjoy the fruit of what's going on in that company. They get there late, put out about halfway, try to figure out how to leave early. But they want all the benefit. That those other 15 are getting. So I've, I've just found out that church is a lot like that. I'm committed, brother. I'm committed. I mean, bless God. This is my house. Okay. Okay. I get it. People can't be here for everything. I understand that. But if you're going to be here on Sunday, you can be here early. If you're going to be here on Wednesday, you can be, though he rewards those who did, I love it, boy, I'm pushing buttons, I like it, I love making new friends. (laughs) He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, diligently, not part time, like every day, diligent, I'm diligent, right? So when you're diligent at something, you're diligent, like every day you're seeking God, seeking the will of God for your life, seeking what God wants you to do that day. I mean, you're searching out in the scripture what God wants for you specifically. I mean, obviously we know God has a general will, but he has a very specific will for each person, but you're going to have to spend some time to figure out what that is. I I have people say, brother, would you pray with me? Okay, what are we praying about? I I just want to know the will of God. Well, okay, but if you're not going to take the time to search that out, me praying for you won't help. Like, it's not a magic trick. It's not just, you know, you come up here, I lay hands on you and rub your head a little bit, and you go back, and then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, you got everything God wants you to have. No? No, you got to walk this thing out. You can come up here and get prayer for something, and it everything looked the same when you go sit down, but that doesn't mean it is. It, the prayer of faith starts to change things. So you have to understand that, okay, now I'm going to seek God on this. You know, your marriage, you say, man, our marriage is in trouble. Seek, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. Individually and together. We have this thing in premarital counseling, and there's a triangle. And there, there's you and your spouse to be on each side of that, and then God at the top of it. And, and the idea is, the more that each of you seek God, the closer together you get. And it's 100% true. The more I seek God on my own, the more Sue seeks God on her own, the closer we are. And everybody in here that, that's doing that knows what I'm talking about. The more you go after God and the heart of God you start to find out there's things in you that aren't pleasing to him and you get rid of those which makes you more pleasing to your spouse. It's like a faith conference and a marriage conference and a get your butt and gear conference all in one. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I, I'm more for having a three day get your butt and gear conference. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I mean, that's as plain as it can get. Like God will reward your labor of seeking him. Majority of people I run into would make terrible poker players. Because everything that runs through that bean between their ears is on their face. (laughs) 
How you doing? Oh, I'm good. Hmm. No, you just lied. You could say, well, look, this is going on in my life, but I'm telling you according to the word of God, I'm fine, and that's what I'm going with. I don't care what my feelings say. I've been seeking the Lord on this deal, and I'm okay. I, don't, I may not look okay. I don't even feel okay, but the Bible says I am, and I'm going with the Bible, and then I will be. So, that, so I'm just going to keep seeking the face of God on this thing, and I'm coming out on the other side. That's how it's going to be. So there you go. You wanted to know? I just told you. You're being honest. You're not trying to skirt around an issue. You're just telling it straight. Look, I have this going on, and I know that looks bad, but I know what the Word says about it. I went to the Word and found out what God said. I sought the Lord. I saw what we sing about it. I sought the Lord and he answered. He heard and he answered. I sought the Lord, he heard and he answered. I sought the Lord, he heard me and he answered me. He's not deaf. Now, uh, okay. Matthew 6. Let's just... Um, Will it be too much trouble to start in verse 25? Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith. Man, that Jesus guy. You know, brother, I believe you need to be more like Jesus. Gladly. But, but here's what happens. When people, when people take on the character of Jesus, then they get offended and say you're too hard. You're, oh, you're, you're just being, you're too hard. I'm just trying to be like Jesus, so I guess he is. No, that's not what I said. Eh, kind of. Are y'all here? You read the same Bible I am? You talk to the same people I do? For the most part. What shall we eat? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. Everything you will ever need will be added to you. Hebrews eleven six. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Matthew six thirty three. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Uh, Psalm 37 verse 4. So we're fasting. And the reality is you'll get something out of it. But many of you are going to lose a lot because you're going to get rid of yourself. So that's what you're doing. You're denying yourself and you're seeking God. Delight yourself also in the Lord. And he'll do what? So I have a question. For the people who think God doesn't reward you for your diligence, can I ask you, who is wrong? Is God wrong or are they wrong?
I just showed you three places in Scripture. And there are many more. Many more. If you delight yourself in the Lord. In other words, what pleases God should please us. And what God abhors, we should. We, we shouldn't call evil good and good evil, although that's what's going on in our culture. And it's a sign of the end. But we should call it what it is. If it's evil, we should declare it evil. And if it's good, we should declare it good. That's why I don't skirt around sin. That's why I'll preach a message against sin. I'm not preaching against a person or a group of people. But I'm telling you, there is a, there's sin that causes people to die. It, sin will take you out early. It, well, that's not very loving. How, how bad do you have to hate somebody to not tell them that what they're doing is going to kill them? Could someone please, for the love of Moses, answer that? Because I hear that garbage all the time. Hey, you're just being hard. There's no love in that. I'm like, there's no love in that. There's no love in telling somebody that what they're doing is going to cause them to lose their family or that's going to cause them to lose their life. There's no love in that. Let me ask you this. If it was you, do you think I'd be loving you if I came to you and said, listen, what you're doing is not okay. It's not okay by the standard I set. It's not okay by the standard God set. I just want to remind you of why Jesus came. I want to remind you of what the blood of Jesus did. I want to remind you that you've been cleansed from all unrighteousness so you can stand before God clean like you've never sinned. Yet you've returned to your vomit. And Jesus, listen, if you, if you read what Jesus said about that kind of life, not good. Not good. I know people want to push that button. Well, you know, I prayed a prayer when I was six. I'm good to go. Take that up with Jesus. Take that up with his word. See what he says. Just see what he says. What are you saying? I'm just telling you, you go see what Jesus says. Come to your own conclusion. I choose to live holy because the Bible says, be ye holy as I am holy. So I'm just going to choose to live a holy life and I'm not going to stand on the line and warm my hands by the fires of hell seeing if I can get into heaven. I'm not going to see how much I can get away with and then go to heaven. That, that's not the kind of life you need to be living. I'm telling you. You, you better understand the window's closing on this deal. And there are many who will call out to him in that day and say, Lord, Lord, and he'll be like, I don't know who you are. Yeah, but I did all this stuff. I don't know you. So, you know, if you walk with the Lord and you don't walk with the Lord, that's what he's talking about. This ain't no I'm in, I'm out, I'm in, I'm out. I'm in. That's it. Well, now what if so, I don't care about what so-and-so does. I'm in. I'm in. It, this is it. It's fixed bayonets and run downhill. There, there is no option. There is no plan. I don't have a plan. A plan B. There is no plan B. Plan A, live for Jesus and go all the way. Amen. It's pretty simple to me. All right. I don't think you're convinced. Revelation 3. Mm. This is the seventh church he's addressing, which is the church age we're in. And the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. Like, you know, you hadn't cooled off enough to be considered cold, yet you ain't really on fire enough to be considered hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. You know, he's, this is a letter to the church, not a letter to the local pub. Not a letter to the local house of ill repute. It's a letter to the church. So then, because you are lukewarm, 
Like you need to be checking your heart where you stand with the Lord. And neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, does this sound familiar? If there's any church on planet earth that fits this, it's the western church. We got all we need, preacher. What I need, what I need to give for. I mean, my God, I'm blessed. Well, <laughs> you better watch it. Because that devourer be eating it from the bottom and you'll never know it. Until it's gone. I'm rich, have become wealthy, and ha- I have need of nothing. You hear people, I don't need God, I got everything I need. I'm like, oh my. Not that's not okay. And do not know. Look, he said, you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You don't even know it. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. There's a lot of people in church have lost their eyesight with God. They, they, they can't see. I'm telling you, if there would have been 10,000 people here when that young man walked up here, there would have been people, could have been some here then, are watching online. Eh. Maybe that's real. You know why? Oh, they call themselves a Christian. They pack a Bible. Probably got one on their coffee table. You got it rolling in there with a dolly. But you know what the deal is? They're lukewarm. I'm being like Jesus. They're lukewarm. They're indifferent. That, that's really, they're just indifferent. They go to church, but they're indifferent. They believe in God, but they're indifferent when it comes to him. They're indifferent about the things God does in the earth today. Today. It's not a yesteryear thing, by the way. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. I mean like be fervent about repenting. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Notice, it's, it bears upon the person what they will do. Jesus is knocking, but the, you know, if you don't open, he ain't kicking the door down like the SWAT team. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Matthew 25. I'm just trying to lay some stuff out for you so that you understand on this fast, you set aside at the first of the year to go after God. You can expect to get something from God, but he expects to get something from you. He expects your life to be different. There should be a marked difference in someone that says they're a, they're a Christian, they love Jesus. There should be a marked difference in their life and someone who doesn't. A marked, it shouldn't blend. It shouldn't even be close to blending because we're not the same. We're not. I'm not the same as a lukewarm person. Mm, got quiet in here. I'm not the same. I'm not the same as them because I'm not indifferent with God. God wakes me up in the middle of the night and says, I don't like this that's in your heart and you need to get on your knees right now. I'm out of the bed, man. Because if he took the time to wake me from my sleep to talk to me about something that's in my life that doesn't please him, I need to do business now it doesn't need to be put off till morning but i watch people they'll dodge altar calls they'll run to the bathroom real quick because they can't stand the heat they'll white knuckle the the back of the chair because they can't stand it why because they're indifferent with god and they don't want to do business with him because it means they're going to have to do business with their self i'm telling you you fast and you pray you're going to do business with somebody because you know You start dying to yourself. You start dying out to yourself. 
I know this is a heartwarming message. Matthew 25, verse 1. Then, then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. They had oil in the vessel and then they had oil in their lamp. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. Those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I don't know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. One old guy said, could that mean half the church ain't ready? Fair question, I'd say. Because that's what he's pointing at. Lord, Lord, I don't know who you are. See, this upsets people's thinking. Because many of you were told that you could say you prayed a prayer and signed your name on a piece of paper and then live like the devil your whole life and God would welcome you in with open arms. And you've been lied to. You have been lied to. Pastor, people ain't going to like that. I found out that there's a lot of people who don't like anything I say. So, whatever. It really doesn't matter. Because there ain't one person on this planet that will be standing and holding my hand when I stand before him. I'll have to give an account for everything I've said and done. So I'm going to let it rip till I go there. Matthew 13, 24. Another parable he put forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came in and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. See, there's a lot of things that are going on in some of your lives and you can't figure out what happened. But you slept on God. And the enemy came in and started planting seeds in your life. And now they're starting to grow up in the middle of your life and you can't figure out what's going on. Man, what's going on? I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand. It might take you a trip to the altar on your face to just say, God, whatever this is, well, I, I don't know. I feel like maybe I took a left turn somewhere. It happens. It can happen. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? Like, how is my life going the way it's going? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the uh, wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and at the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles uh, to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Second Timothy 
3, verse 5. Well, let's just start in verse 1 since I didn't give you any of it. Perilous times and perilous men is what my heading says. Could you say we're in perilous times? If I showed you what I just got on my phone about 10 minutes ago, you'd think perilous times. Because I got pictures of a church in a country I preached in, and the whole front of the church was full of dead bodies. You know why? Because evil people dropped a bomb on it and killed the people in the church. Sounds pretty perilous to me. All because they worship Jesus. So they dropped a bomb on them to kill them. And they did. Killed them. Perilous times. But know this. In the last days, perilous times will come. They're coming. It, I'm telling you. Th this whole idea that we got it cushy to the end is insane. We don't. However, I mean those people... Born again, bomb lands, next thing they see, they're standing there with Jesus. I mean, you know, we're all headed there. I don't want to leave today. But you understand what I'm saying. That, that's why you got to live it. You got to live it. For men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedience to parents. You better listen up, young people, teenagers. Think you got it all figured out? You do not. You think your parents are stupid now? Wait till you get grown. They're going to be the smartest people that put shoes on. I'm telling you, you better listen to what I'm saying. You think I'm joking? Apparently you do because ain't all of you paying attention. You're too busy talking to one another. Don't mess with me. I'm telling you. I'll come back here and jerk a stinking knot in your chain which should have been done 10 years ago. I'm telling you, a bunch of y'all needed a dad like mine who could look across a room this big. I made eye contact with him. Hunt a chair because the next thing coming ain't good. So parents... I'm telling you, you need to get a rain on your kids. That's right. And that's what we used to tell Aaron when she was growing up. I said, I'm not your friend. When you get grown and you're of age, then I can be your friend. But right now, I am not your friend. Let's just keep it straight. My dad told me when I worked with him, I'm telling you, he would have fired me in a New York minute. And we were on the road somewhere. He said, son, we need to talk. I said, okay. He said, let's get one thing straight. Yes, sir. Out here, I'm your boss. At home, I'm your daddy. You understand? I said, yes, sir. He said, okay. And that was it. I didn't have to have no more pep talks. That's the one and only. He's the boss, not me. What he says, I do. And if I don't, I get a bus ticket. Not on his dime, on my own. Zeke grew up with a dad like that. That's why he's amen. I'm telling you, young people, don't be disobedient to your parents. You need to honor your father and mother because that's the, that's the first commandment with a promise. Disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. Unthankful. Oh, man, I need to move on. Unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, and despisers of good. There are people, it doesn't matter what you do or how good it is, they don't like it. They don't like it. Traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form, oh my God. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. You know, I made a statement. Mm, 
probably 10 years ago now. I don't run with everybody. Doesn't mean I don't love people. But I don't run with everybody. Because when I get around people, I can t- I'm like, mm, I like you, but I don't think I can hang with you. Because me and you are on a different track. You judging them, preacher? I don't know. Call it whatever you want. But I see the fruit of their life, and I don't want that fruit in mine. I don't want them putting fruit with worms in it in my basket. I don't want them planting seeds of tares in my wheat. That's what I'm saying. We well, had never hung out with me. Are you talking about me? No. But see, that's what people think. You know why? Because people have a complex. It's their self-esteem issue. And they think everybody's out to get them. Nobody likes them. Nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to eat worms and die. It's like, good Lord, get a grip on yourself. Problem is, a lot of people love their self more than they love anybody. And they think if everybody don't love them like they do, they must be against them. I, I would encourage you strongly to go listen to the message that was preached Sunday morning at Covenant Connections by Paul Johnson. Because there are people in here, you deal with shame and you do a lot of things to cover it over. You need to listen to that message in private and let the Spirit of God deal with you. That's your homework. I don't want to do that. That's fine. Keep carrying it then. Keep being haughty. Keep being high-minded. Verse 6, for out of this sort of those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women headed down, uh, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Oh my. Lot of people in this world. I want to tell you what they know. And they have zero knowledge of the truth. They're quick to bump them gums and tell you what they know. But they don't have knowledge. In other words, they don't have revelation knowledge of what they're saying out of their mouth. And they lead people away. They'll lead people out of your life. They're all they're everywhere. People like this are everywhere. You understand that. You can, get, you can get mad here, butt hurt at somebody, leave here and go to another church and think it's perfect. And that same kind of person would be in that church. If nothing else, you went there. You know, if you just hop church to church and everybody's a the problem, there is one common denominator in this math problem. I thought you were going to teach us about fasting. I just did for 30 minutes. If you'll die to yourself and allow God to show you, God, am I in any of this? Do I fit any of that? Because if I do, I want to know. How many of you know you can be in the middle of something and not know it? You, you can be headed the wrong way. I mean, we just saw how you can be headed the wrong way and not realize it. And people yelling at you going, hey, what are you doing? Don't judge me. Who do you think you are? Well, then mash the gas and see what it gets you. There are many people that are starting to make a left turn down the wrong way. Jesus said it would happen. But that doesn't mean we stop warning people. Right? You don't, I mean... Not everybody's going to get born again, but we preach like they will. Because it's God's will they do. So you preach like they're all going to get born again. So you send out warnings hoping that people listen. And sometimes they do hear, but it never gets to hear. So they'll go out and, you know, 
they'll go, and it's not just me. I, I'm not saying it just about myself. I'm saying this is in churches everywhere. People will go out, get in their car, and then eat the preacher for lunch because they didn't like one thing he said and miss the entire meal of the message to get what was in there. So they trash the preacher. Now they do it in front of their kids. So their kids grow up, and then later they can't understand why their kids won't go to church. You trained them not to. You trained them to dislike the church and to dislike church people and to dislike God. I'm not saying you. I'm saying don't do this. You understand what I'm saying? There are people whose kids won't darken the door of a church and the reason is they taught them to not love the house of God. They taught them with their mouth and with their actions. Church, going to church, you know, if it fits in, we'll go. If we got time for God, we'll make it. So when they don't make time for God, when you raise them up, you, you know, just bringing them to church doesn't mean raising them up in the admonition of the Lord. You brought them to church. They were at youth group. You know, they checked all the boxes because you checked all the boxes. Then they go to college. And they ain't got the word in them. They don't have a foundation in them. And they go sit with professors who hate God, who talk God down. And then they show back up. I don't know if there's anybody on the back row like this, but it is. And the shoe fits. I guess you're going to have to wear it. They come back from college. They got a nose ring. They got purple hair. And they hate you. And they hate God. I don't know what happened to my kid. Well, it's pretty simple. You told them it was an option. You told them it was an option. Baseball was more important. Everything they could put in front of them was more important. Everything was more important. It took the time that God wanted with them. It was all more important. You made everything else more important than time with God. And then, parents, preacher, I need you to come counsel my child. I can't counsel your child. They're 18 now. They're 18. They're an adult, and they've made their mind up. They don't even really like you, but they're living there because they can get stuff for free. So I wish you'd be more like a pastor. If I was any more like a pastor right now, I'd be flying around the room. This is what people need. People don't want this, but it's what they need. They need these daddy talks. They, people need that. You need to understand there is a devil trying to destroy your family and take your kids out, and you need somebody to tell you this kind of stuff. And when you kids back there go to college, you'll hear what I'm saying. There are going to be professors tell you how God doesn't exist, how it's all a fable, how it's not true, and you had a chance. You had a chance. So you can dig in. You can dig your heels in. All you young people, you better hear, hear me. I know he's ah. He got gray hair. Yeah, I got gray hair for a reason. It's the wisdom of God. So pay attention. You better spend the time you've got now digging your heels in with God. You better spend your time searching out the ways of God. You spend your time building that foundation. That way when you go to college and some moron standing up there telling you about how the word of God's a fable and God doesn't exist, you can say, excuse me, excuse me. That is completely untrue what you just said. And here's why. And throw down. Open that Bible up and you show them. That, and if they believe it or not, it doesn't matter. You stood your ground. I was taking night classes one time. And, we, and I was taking uh, psychology. And the guy teaching, he was an atheist. He didn't believe in God. He would talk God down. I'm like, I've had enough of this clown. And you, were you in there, Elliot? Yeah. And uh, Jason Spielman's sister was in there. And I, I mean, some of you think I'm rough now. I had zero polish then. <laughs> like I was about a half a breath away from just knocking his teeth out. He's just going on. And I, I leaned over and told Jason's sister, I said, we're getting out of class early tonight. She goes, huh? I said, wait and see. And I just started ripping it. I thought that guy was going to pee himself. Because he had no rebuttal for that book. And 
we got out of class way early. She goes, oh, my Lord. I said, I told you. People, people want to walk on you like a door. This is why you need to know the Word of God. That's why, like, Caneo, that's why it's so important. Because you, you get a foundation under you, people say dumb stuff to you. You're like, whatever, that ain't in the Word at all. So you, you get a foundation where you can rightfully divide the Word of God. Please hear what I'm saying. I'm not beating up on anybody. I, I'm telling you, young people, listen to me. You have the greatest opportunity that anybody in this room has ever had. You, you're talking about a harvest field that's ready for the picking. Just like you, Nathan. You need to tell everybody you meet what happened to you. Because it's a testimony to the greatness of God. I'm telling you. So well, I don't know the Bible all that well. Okay, but you know the guy that wrote it. And he came and touched you, and then now you can learn what he put in his book. Amen. Know what the Word says so you can be silent about it. That's why when people come at me about faith, I'm like, whatever. Faith is faith. There's weak faith, strong faith, little faith, and no faith. Where do you fit? You're saying, I don't have any faith? I'm not saying you don't have any faith, but if your actions prove it out, then we would all have to agree that that would be the case. Jesus said they had little faith. Oh, you a little faith. We just read it. Oh, you a little faith. They had a lot of doubt. No faith. Is that right? You want prayer? Praise the Lord. been able to kneel for years. Praise the Lord. She said,
said, when I go to the altar, I want to be able to kneel before the Lord, and I hadn't been able to. Well, you look like you did a pretty good job to me. Hallelujah, let's take another walk. Man, praise the Lord. Look at this. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Man, you're speeding up. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Come on. Come on. Oh, look at it. Now, that's a pretty good clip. Hallelujah. Amen. That's awesome. I'm telling you, we're moving at a pretty good pace. She can plant flowers again, she said. You might get a ripe tomato this year, Brother Tony. Amen. Come on. Hallelujah. We are in a miracle. We're standing right in the middle of a miracle. My goodness. Hallelujah. God is good. Where else should we be? Where else should we be, right? I want to be right smack dab in the middle of a miracle. This is a miracle believing house. Amen. Wow. Good, good stuff. Good things are happening. 2024, it's going to be the best year yet. Amen. All right, I'm here, you know, just to give you a few announcements. Senior food hand up is tomorrow from 10 to 12. If you can come and volunteer and help with any of that, we would appreciate that. They start preparing those bags at 9 a.m. in the morning right here um, at the church. Also, our women's meeting is January the 12th. That's this upcoming Friday. My goodness. I'm like, we're halfway through January. How'd that happen? Goodness. So January the 12th, this Friday night, 7 o'clock, we have our women's meeting. Ladies, come hang out. Come hang out together. Iron sharpening iron. Amen. It's good stuff. And then Sunday night, Pastor Chris and I will be back up in Bowling Green at New Life Church. Um, that service starts at 6 p.m. They also do that live stream. Am I correct? Yeah, you can watch that online or it's just two and a half hours. Come and join us. Oh. What is it? Two hours? Two hours. An hour and 50 minutes, right? Yeah. So it's not that far. Come and join us. Amen. And then don't forget, you can go back to the welcome desk and get any extra information if you're looking for something uh, going on here at Life in Christ. The welcome desk will help you get that. Amen. All right. Lift your hand to heaven. Let's just, let's just thank you. Father God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. For who you are and what you've done. I thank you, Father God, that this house is blessed. And I thank you that miracles, miracles, signs, and wonders are always right within our reach. We give you praise. Lord, I thank you for every person under the sound of my voice. I believe they're blessed and highly favored. And I believe everything they touch is blessed in the name of Jesus. Amen. You are dismissed. Prayer is tomorrow night, 7 o'clock.